Okay, so just going to head out on the uh, Euro 5 Himalayan. It's a bike that's sadly been off the fleet for uh, a month or so, simply because of a faulty ABS sensor, which I knocked when putting in the back wheel. So the bike at the minute uh, isn't got ABS working, and because it's got a speed sensor as part of the ABS sensor, the speedo's not working either. So uh, the bike's off fleet, but for me to ride it myself, no problem at all. So I'm going to take it for a spin, to show you what I think about it uh, in comparison to the uh, Euro 4 bike. Right, cheers. Okay, so most changes to the Euro 5 bike are largely just uh, for the sake of passing emission regulations. So the cat has been uh, relocated further up the downpipe. That's, I believe, to give it a sort of a hotter, leaner burn and to sort of reduce emissions that way. Uh, they've also moved the carbon canister uh, that used to be in the belly of the sump guard and now it's sort of tucked up behind the um, the rear panel, the rear mud guard, so it's all under there. So um, it's basically a tidy it up job. What it's done from a riding point of view is to me just, just smoothed out the low end fueling. So crawling along in traffic on and off uh, throttle. It's just it's just improved that, just refined it a little bit. It doesn't feel quite as agricultural um, as the original uh, bike. You could say uh, the agricultural nature was always part of the Himalayan's charm. I think they've almost japanese it a, a little bit. It's just a little bit smoother on the roll-on, roll-off of the throttle. Uh, and it doesn't, I suspect, it's not going to be quite as stally as the, uh, as the original bike could sometimes uh, be. So basically just a tidy up. Then we've got the tripper computer just there uh, on the side of the uh, dash, which could be a really good uh, t tool or toy for someone to use that simply pairs it to your smartphone that you can get so you can get uh, directional arrows come up on that uh, and it's something they're already fitting or also fit into the Meteor so a nice little bit of simple technology basically a basic uh, sat nav you've got revised uh, frame guards that's just to give you a bit more uh, knee room so that applies mainly to tall or long-legged riders who uh, up until now or on the Euro 4 bikes, found themselves banging the knees on the on the frame. There is sort of um, a suggestion uh, that maybe they're not as strong now. Uh, and personally, I don't prefer the the new engine guards. I think they've lost a little bit of their practicality. Um, they were always really handy for me for for mounting uh, dry bags too. So I put my clothes in in a dry bag either side, and that would empty out the the panniers for other things. So. Yeah, uh, it's kind of one step forward, one step back in that regard. Also, the stronger rear rack on the rear, which is now, I think, rated to take six kilos. So not a huge amount. Let's have a look. I think it's six, seven kilos. But I think the fact that they've just addressed some of the basic problems. Uh, the clock's still missed up a little bit, so they've not cured that. Although uh, I suspect what they've essentially got is is the mouldings uh, of many millions that uh, they've simply updated with a tripper computer. And so it's simply the same clocks as we're on the Euro 4 bike, just with a new uh, new dials, new screen, just a, a white light now rather than a, an amber one. Um, so not a lot else. What are their problems? I mean, who's to say yet if they fix the head bearing uh, issue? So it is quite common for, for the Himalaya to suffer uh, notchy head bearings quite early on in its uh, life cycle, really. I mean, I've had most of mine have gone around 6,000 miles. In fairness, they do get a lot of abuse off road, and so that could be uh, aiding or speeding up the erosion process simply because they're getting a lot of uh, grit and grit, uh, grit and grime in there and also more jet washing. I am very careful with jet washing the bike just to make sure I don't get the uh, the old jet on it but uh, sometimes it's a bit inevitable. So really that's it, yeah, it's a sort of a spit and polish job the Euro 5, in a sense it's a slight bit of disappointment, you kind of thought maybe they would up the engine size and maybe make it out to the sort of 460cc mark, which uh, Hitchcock's do the kit to, to do. Um, it seemed like a good opportunity. Uh, I suppose I was comparing it to the CRF 250 and the step up to the 300, maybe if they'd have done something like that. But at the same time, the, the CRF is, was eight years, nine years in its uh, product cycle before that finally got the upgrade to the 300. So with the Himalayan not probably only being in its fourth year of production, um, it's, it was probably optimistic to think they'd do an engine upgrade. Obviously, big talk of the 650 and whether that's going to be coming. Uh, that's going to come in the, in the Himalayan chassis. You know, for me, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. I think pretty categorically, there's not going to be a Himalayan 650 uh, with the twin engine. Um, 
and personally I think it would ruin the bike. The beauty of the Himalayan is it's a lovely tractable, relatively light, light is probably too strong a word, but manageable machine and that single cylinder engine just really suits its nature and obviously the, the chassis has been built around the engine so the the chassis, the suspension, the brakes, everything, the wheels, the geometry has built have been, been built around the, the 410 engine. So it's not a simple case of just whacking in a 650 lump and away you go. It would completely take a it would take a complete redesign or new bike to make that happen and they just aren't gonna do that. So for me, well if they, they could do that but it won't work. So for me I think what we're gonna see is a slightly enlarged, possibly liquid cooled single cylinder engine and I think that would really take it into another league. If even if it was 35 brake horsepower with the same amount of long stroke torque. That would be ideal uh, and then possibly maybe we'll see a 650 twin based um, scrambler street scrambler so a bit more comfortable a bit more upright a bit more uh, able to carry luggage than the interceptor and continental but uh, a more road biased bike built around that engine so we could see it go off in sort of two directions and i think that would suit a lot of people the 650 twin um, road biased bike for for the majority of people who just want um, a bit more power and then the Himalayan is still with a single cylinder for those who kind of want to use it for what it was intended which was a, an all-roads bike this is a low mileage machine it's only got 411 miles on the clock so I'm not going to be revving it out 4,000 four and a half possibly but for me the bike with 24 horsepower isn't it's not a fast bike there's no point pretending that it will accelerate with vigor it won't but what it is, is talking, and that's, so I think other than on long stretches of motorway, I, I never find the Himalayan to be that underwhelmed. Um, and if anybody saw the um, Tale of the Dragon video I put up the other day from a few years ago in America, uh, I think the bike handles so well on the road, the suspension is so good, the chassis is so well tuned, that you can carry so much pace and therefore it's more about momentum than it is about outright speed. So, you know, sometimes I wonder if those complaining about a lack of power maybe ought to work on their riding, which is probably a bit of, you know, maybe a bit of harsh blow, but I, I don't think you can f blame it all on the bike. But hey, let's try off-road, shall we? Second gear. I'm down into first. So this is a lane... So this is a, a lane... I've used on a few videos recently, 300 Rally CRF, CB500X. I also tried to get it up, get up it on the Guzzi, and failed miserably midway. I also tried to get it, or I went up it, came up it on the Posty bikes the other day, which wasn't too bad. So I'm just tractoring up in first. Now the Himalayan weighs about 40 kilos more than the CRF, and it is evident that there is more bike to move around. What works in the Himalayan's favour is it's low centre of gravity, it's really well balanced, it's really chuggable on the throttle and the suspension copes really well for the fact that it's got not a lot of ground, um, ground clearance or suspension travel. So somehow the Himalayan is more than the sum of its parts and that really I think is why I've always warmed to it so, so strongly because here's a bike, £4,000, let's cut that off, always stop here. Here's a bike, £4,000 when it first came out, okay it's gone up to four and a half now, such is life. Um, it's a bike that came out and everyone wrote it off, it's going to be absolutely crap. I bought one of the very first ones into Britain and uh, I think I was just interested. You know, For that sort of money, it seemed to offer so much. And it, was it a gamble? I guess it always is a gamble spending money on the non-obvious choice, which the Himalayan was back then. It was, uh, but really, other than the CRF 250, V-Strom 250, Kawasaki Versys, none of which really ticked my boxes, because I wanted something that could travel on the road really nicely with the luggage, but also do a bit of trail. So the Himalayan came out at four. I thought, going to give that a go. And I've got to be honest, I was, I was so impressed with it as an all-round bike. I think I did 19... 18,000 miles that first year on that first bike. I, I, I guided trips, Lands End to John O'Groats. Uh, I took a group across America, east coast to west, uh, with riders on faster bikes. I sold that bike and then bought another one. Uh, and I, I did a trip out, guided a group back from Bulgaria, so over the Alps and stuff. And obviously the, the, the Himalayan runs out of puff when you're going over the Alps and you've got a GS1200 behind you. But in the corners, it could really carve and it could really excite you as a rider's bike, which 
I think people have, have been quick to, or people who've never ridden it, have been quick to dismiss it, dismiss it as something that can't be ridden fast or can't be ridden well or can't carry, I don't know, it, that isn't a good bike, but I, I've really found it just an enjoyable bike to ride. People say I'm biased towards the Himalayan. I think some people even think maybe I'm paid off, but I certainly, um, certainly am the former, but definitely not the latter. Um, the best I've had at Royal Enfield, they've just sent me a jacket, which is quite nice, but it really doesn't buy me my favouritism. It would take much more than that. So, yeah, it still is my favourite bike of the A2 bikes. Um, again, for the simple fact that I could, today, let's say, for example, I could have done 400 miles on the road with the panniers on, no problem at all, in comfort, getting at least 85 miles to the gallon. And then I could have come up here and whipped up that lane, no problems at all. And for me, there's no other bike in this class at this price uh, bracket that, that sort of does that GS. I mean, I guess it's really, the Himalayan for me is the ultimate GS, uh, which, uh, which when BMW coined the phrase stood for on-road, off-road. Uh, and so, to me, the Himalayan is the ultimate GS, and it's probably the bike that uh, BMW should really have uh, built. So, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to shut up, because I talk too much, and I'm going to just take you on a few lanes, narrate them as I go, uh, and just show you what the bike uh, can do, and let's go from there, really. One thing I just wanted to, to say about off-road riding, now, um, lots of people wanted to get into it, and, it, and sometimes people try and run before they can walk, which is no bad thing, because that's what, you know, guess what I did. It's pretty much what I did, but I think the best, the thing you need to really think about with off-road riding is slow, sl slow speed bike control. And one of the very first drills I did when I went did the off-road skills at BMW, one of the things I teach you is to ride, to walk beside your bike, slip in the clutch. Because slipping the clutch and clutch control, and slow speed clutch control, is the essence of off-road riding. It can get you out of a tricky situation. It can give you time to breathe, pause, assess, then react and go. If you're riding on the power all the time with the clutch out, you don't have that um, luxury of time. So you can't take a breath, assess, and then release and go. And you can't equally ride at that very slow speed that some tricky trails might need you, need to. So one of the best drills, Simply just first gear and then just get used to your biting point and just feel the weight of the bike and what power and what revs and what clutch action it needs just to get that bike walking, moving like this. And then you start doing figure of eights and you just feel, you build up precision in the throttle, in the clutch, so you're not over revving, you know, you're not having to keep blipping the throttle to get that doing. I mean, all I'm doing now, I've got clutch feather, feathering it slightly at its release point, and then a very, f a fraction of a throttle, just to pick it up. Because if I, if I don't put a bit of throttle in, it, it's wanting to labour and store. So just a touch, just a fluff of, um, just a fluff of revs, and that'll do it. And it's from being able to do this that you can then do the whole, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> off balance, let's try it again. It's a bit narrow down here. But it's being able to do that, and have that slow speed clutch control, where you can do the whole foot, foot peg on the, foot peg on the, uh, foot on the put peg and go maneuver. Which is very easy once you've learned basic clutch control. I definitely think this Euro 5 bike is is a bit happier ticking along at this sort of second second gear low rev uh, pace than the Euro 4 bike. It's only it's only little. It's not not a huge change at all, really, compared to the step from the CRF 3, 250 to the 300, which is very noticeable. Which is, to be honest, has made that bike really good. The Euro 5 bike is just polished. It's polished as stone. Does it matter if you buy a Euro 5, 4 bike or a Euro 5 bike? I don't think it really matters too much. You'd be splitting airs over as to which was better. A lot will come down to what deal you got on, on one or what colour scheme you wanted. The servicing intervals are still the same. That slightly frustrating 3,000 mile official uh, servicing is, is annoying. You know, I wish they'd stepped it up. I wish they'd, I wish they'd matched the other manufacturers with 6,000. Although, in fairness, the KTM's 4,000, so 
it's not that bad and, and the beauty of the Himalayan is very easy to, to self-service the valves screw and lock nut you know even I can do that but officially it would be nice just to stretch that out a bit even if it just reduced your servicing costs a little bit the Honda at 8000 obviously is the benchmark but bikes like the V-Strom 250 and the Versys 300 they were worse than the Himalayan because they had 3000 service intervals uh, mile service intervals and they had uh, shims which needed checking frequently and that was a much bigger more costly job so the Himalayan wasn't the worst in fairness just to confirm this is running stock Seat tyres which are new for this uh, Euro 5 bike I've got to be honest I don't think the, the Himalayan is that tyre sensitive I think you could put any old slicks on this thing and it has still got these kind of lanes I think mainly because of the long stroke motor generates traction all of its own uh, through the rear wheel then the front wheel's nice and slender uh, 90 90 21 which means it cuts through things rather than um, washing out as, as, as can happen on the, the broader wire, broader tired bikes such as the 310 GS or the, the KTM uh, 390 obviously a, knob, a knobbly is going to help but again if you're relying on the tyre to make you a better off-road rider you're starting unfortunately with the wrong end of the stick the only thing you've really got to watch with a bike like this which is upwards towards well it's 209 kilos on the scales when I uh, weighed the Euro 4 bike fully fueled so maybe a kilo here and there difference for the Euro 5 but the main thing you've got to watch is camber so the cut of the trail if a trail's flat you're relatively all right but if there's a pitch in it like a, a raised section or a trough or a rut it, it's right in the the it's right in the slot the angled part of it that is, is what's going to let the front wash out under you then the front's going to go so to me riding off road on on something like the Himalayan or any of the big adventure bikes or any of the A2 bikes is really watching for camber if you if you learn to read the camber of the road and adjust your body weight accordingly because if you obviously pitch off to one side of the bike on, a, on an off camber you can compensate for it a bit like skiing if you've ever skied across you know when you're traversing across a mountain so there are ways to compensate but it relies on reading that situation before you have to compensate this is a nice little lane this is the lane I use uh, on the A2 test days so um, when people come down and ride the CRF the Himalayan the 390 the 310 and the 500x back to back this is the lane I use simply because it's it's pretty manageable even for a novice rider take it steady um, give them a few pointers at the bottom and it's just nice and predictable so you can build confidence and just show them what a bike can do and, and how it behaves on a dirt surface that's sort of that the, the disconnect between the front wheel and the back because obviously the front might be on a bit of dry patch and the wet might be on a bit of wet so just getting used to the different movement of the two wheels which is very uh, different obviously to road riding which is very predictable by comparison obviously teaching them to scan ahead keep the head up look for obstacles look for those cambers look for potholes look for vehicles coming look for braking points consider what gear you're in so I did a downshift then just to prepare for that little obstacle go around that obstacle still got the head up not working the engine too hard because it's obviously still been running but I want a, I want a th soft throttle input I ride a high gear generally on and off road because I don't want an aggressive input on the throttle I want something that I can roll on and roll off without any sudden change in speed of the of the engine or the bike so I'm in, I'm in third at the minute I can't tell you what speed I'm doing because my speedo is not working but I've got soft arms I've got a slight bend in the knee I've got my bum back a little bit I've got my elbows up increasing the width of my sort of shoulder stance which gives better grip, leverage and strength on the bars but certainly avoiding the death grip which is what goes which what 
a novice rider tends to do the grip for dear life of the arms when off-roading really is all about the feet as a main contact point the arms are just there to guide and sort of have a gentle input but it's really all through the feet all through the feet just watching it down here we've nicknamed this road this lane the John Deere test track <coughs> because there are many tractors come down it and they uh, travel relatively briskly so that's it Euro 5 Himalayan is it any different to Euro 4? not really not really performance is no different handling no different a bit of better fuel in at the bottom end some improved changes stronger rear rack but at the expense of the slightly butchered front rack which uh, I don't like I'd be interested in seeing if you could put a, an old one on the, on, the, on the new bike but what the Himalaya does and what people find when they ride it down here is it gives great stability and confidence which none of the other bikes give as much of the CRF is, is great you know it's a trail bike but it feels quite flighty and light and darty uh, along that surface there and for a novice rider that's disconcerting by comparison the Himalayan just feels like you're riding on the back of a long um, sort of girder or something it's so planted in the dirt it doesn't move around um, it doesn't feel like it's going to misbehave or squirm and for a novice rider it's exactly what you want the only criticism this year um, perversely is a, is a side stand which was too long on the Euro 4 bike which made it sit too upright and therefore there was a danger especially when you were loaded of it toppling over that way which happened to mine several times so they've gone the opposite way and made it too short so now to me that leans f too far over especially with a bit of camber on the road so if you had a bit of luggage it could be a tendency for it to topple that way so somehow they managed to get it wrong on both occasions that must take great effort <laughs> My only other criticism, parts, parts availability. Uh, and it applies to a lot of brands at the minute, to be honest. None of them have got their acting gear. Uh, I think some of it's Brexit, some of it's Covid, some of it's whatever. But the fact that I can't get an ABS sensor for this for sort of five weeks and other people have waited on parts for their Himalayans for six weeks, seven weeks, whatever. I don't think it's good enough in this day and age when you can FedEx a parcel from India in 24 hours, 48 hours, plenty of people on eBay are doing it. Why an organisation, a company like Royal Enfield with importers as established as MotoGB can't have a, a relationship whereby somebody says, hey, you know what, we've, we've got a guy in England who needs this and we've got a guy who needs that. Can you go to that big factory where you're making all these bikes with all those parts, pick one, put it in an envelope and send it? I, I don't get why we should there should be an excuse for this six weeks, ten weeks window that they, that, that they do. And it's not just Royal Enfield, it's... I hear the same story with plenty of other manufacturers, but... Uh, it's more relevant to me that Royal Enfield are rubbish at the minute. And I don't know if it's a Royal Enfield or a MotoGB importer issue. I don't know if it's Covid, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's lots of excuses, but... Ultimately, if you're selling a product, you should be able to back it up with parts. And that is my only frustration. Because the dealers, I've got to be honest, the dealers of Royal, that De Royal Enfield have got in the UK are very good. They're really passionate about the brand. Well, not universally, but most seem to be. Passionate about the brand. They know the bikes. They seem to like working on them. If only they could get hold of the damn bars. So. That's it. I'll see you on the next trail. Take it easy. Bye. Just before I hit that next lane, I just want to see if anybody is interested in doing a oh, horse and cart. So I'm going left, Mister. Oh, thank you. Cheers. I uh, just wondering if anybody is doing uh, one interested in doing uh, Himalayan adventure bunkhouse weekend sometime mid-November. Uh, just be down in Exmoor bunkhouse three nights. Well. Three nights or two, whichever you can make. Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. We'll go out for some riding. 
mainly road riding but just some interesting roads, back roads uh, do a little bit of trail riding for those who fancy it the idea is just to get out of the bikes in, in what will be late autumn by then so if you're interested in that just put a note in the comments say me or yes I am or something worse to that effect just so I've got an idea of interest uh, and figures numbers so I can get something booked up I say, let's get out on the Himalayans. Equally, if you've got another A2 bike, let's not uh, let's let's not be uh, snobbish. If you've got a CRF or a V-Strom 250 or a 500X, more than welcome, more than welcome. Because I think for me, the more bikes I ride, the more I really just really re respect and appreciate the A2 class of bikes because these bikes are manageable and allow you to have an adventure without the fear or intimidation of the bigger bikes. I was out on the Guzzi V85 the other day and I thought, my word, this is a big old lump. Um, I've got to be honest, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it. So the Guzzi's up for sale if anybody wants a blue Guzzi V85. That I can't find second spare key for. Bloody thing. Alright, see you on the next lane. Just going up to another little lane. It's getting a bit dim in light. Feels like autumn's on its way, doesn't it? A little bit. Did we have a summer? I think we did just about. But first day of September seems to be marking the first day of uh, autumn here in North Devon. So a good little lane, this one. It's been closed for a while. Uh, there was a bit of a, a sinkhole opened up, which I actually nearly lost the GS310 down. So, oh my word. Okay. Let's have a look. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Oh, a little bit of a problem there with the Himalayan. Those low foot pegs or that low ground clearance means that when you get in a rut, your feet catch on it. And if your feet catch on a rut, that kicks your foot off and makes it hard work. So that's really the main complaint with off-roading on the Himalayan it is ground clearance uh, or foot, foot peg clearance, let's say, because it's more often that your feet catch rather than the actual uh, sump itself. Uh, and it makes it tricky, I've got to be honest, you've got to ride around it, compensate for it and be very mindful of it because it will uh, it will throw you off if you catch a foot on a roll or it'll twist your ankle and break your ankle. But I think we have to accept that uh, Royal Enfield never designed the, the Himalayan to be a, a UK trail bike. So we can't criticise it too heavily I don't think. Squirrel. It's always a tricky little section. This has got a raised section with a slender ridge running along the top. You've just got to sit in, head up, look through it. It's nice and dry along here, actually. It's normally quite boggy, so summer has been kind to it. I've just got a partial throttle. Second gear, as I say, just feathering that clutch. I've got two fingers over the clutch. I don't know if you can see that. That's just ready to give that clutch a bit of a slip, if need be, if, if revs drop or whatever. Or oh, I just need a bit of a squirt to... Pull, push through something but so far so easy with braking on this sort of terrain you really want to be leading with a back brake put a gentle gradual pressure on the rear and if you need a bit more then start to bring in the front and that just helps the bike sit more uh, square with the ground and it stops you overwhelming the front contact patch of the tyre and obviously the front washing out which is a common problem or common uh, uh, issue people novices have they Grab a bit of front brake on a whip, bit, bit of wet mud and down they go. So always lead with the bike and then bring in the front. Which translates well to the road as well. It's a good principle to follow. Just stabilises the bike and gives maximum front braking performance. I think if anybody could get off-road training it, it enhances your riding all round really. Uh, I think rather than learning doing advanced road riding, I think a lot of people would be ben benefit from off-road training, tuition. Shit me, I've got something in my eye. That's a... Ah, midget my eye. That's a problem with riding. Dusk with a visor up. That'll teach me. So yeah, what was I saying? Uh, a lot of people would benefit from off-road riding. Simply because it teaches you low speed skills. It, it teaches you bike control which I, I think is such an essential part of uh, being comfortable with the machine that you're riding and uh, getting the most out of it. 
if you can do those slow speed maneuvers, if you can have good control of the bike, it really enhances your enjoyment and the scope at which you can go. If you're intimidated by your bike, that's never a good thing. Interesting little climbing section here. Last time I came up here, it's got quite a big divot in the middle. So I'm going to approach, tread gently here, just around this corner. And I have to move over to the left. It's in real darkness. It's not the best, to be honest. I hope you can see this on the camera. So we've got exposed stone there. I don't want to drop into that trench. I've got soft throttle first gear, weight back. I've got my weight back over the back of the bike just to keep that back wheel contact with the ground. Soft throttle, I'm not overwhelming it. I don't want it to spin up. Constant drive. I'm not going to go for second. It would take second, but I'm just going to keep constant drive. And then I'm out. Clutching. End of the lane. Nice that. Enjoyed that. Right. I'm going to take you to the next lane, which is a bit trickier. But I think what it shows is, reinforces, is just how capable the Himalayan is. Yes, there's the limitations of, of uh, foot peg clearance. Uh, which can be rectified. Cooperb do a lift kit which put a riser on the front fork and a, a longer rear shock and that does give more ground clearance. So that is one option, about 400 quid that. That would give you the ground clearance you needed to get through those ruts. Whoops, a daisy. I haven't got my rear seat on right. But I think that coming up that, la la that sort of lane, to me that's a trail bike lane that is. That's not an adventure lane, that's a trail bike lane. And then the lane comes up that, I'm not going to say easy, but it comes up a lot easier than you think it's going to and with a lot more control, coordination, crispness, capability. It just it just comes up there nicely. I've got the 390 KTM up there and I've got the 310 GS up there uh, and the 500X has come up most of them lanes. But you almost feel you're having to ride around the obstacles, you're having to really pick your clean line you're having to work against the limitations of the bike. The bike not, isn't naturally wanting to go up that lane. And therefore, you get it up there, and you go, well, that bike can do it. That bike's not as bad as off-road off as, as you think. Especially something like the 390 KTM, which has got that kind of awful crouch standing position, which makes it laboursome. But you get it up there, and you go, well, that's, that's pretty good, it got up there. The Himalayan feels like that's its natural terrain. That feels like the suspension copes, the power's good, the standing position's natural. And so all the ingredients are there to make a lane like that perfectly manageable uh, for, um, I'm going to say, an intermediate novice to intermediate rider. A novice rider is probably not going to get up there first time. <coughs> but you know what? Even if they had a go, it would, it would, the bike would do its best to get you up it. I get the sense with the Himalayan that the bike is willing to work with you rather than against you. It's a good friend. And again, for an adventure bike that you're taking on a journey with you, that's a really good attribute. Um, I should be a salesman for Royal Enfield, shouldn't I? Shit me. As I say, best I've had out of them is a jacket, which I'm very grateful for, don't get me wrong. But, if Kawasaki came out tomorrow with a Versus 400 with nice soft suspension, nicely capable, Nice torquey 400 engine. You know, I could easily be swung, swayed. Whoops, it is. Let's watch that car too, then. It's interesting what's on the horizon at the minute, bike wise. I rode the Vosge uh, 500 the other day, which is a really good road biased adventure bike coming out of China. Then you've got the Motor Marini XX Kate, which I think looks fantastic. A 650 twin engine, um, sort of 64 horsepower, I think. A little bit weighty, 220 kilos, but I don't pay a lot of attention to, to on paper weight these days because most of the time it doesn't translate into how the bike feels. The Himalayan, 210 kilos, doesn't feel like a 210 kilo bike. So pinch of salt there, but the Motor Marini looks good. And, and I think, you know, as many people are against the principle of China selling bikes, I, I think the Chinese, bless them, have, have got this knack of being quite quick and re responsive to customer demand and the way the market is going, i.e., smaller bikes. So they brought out this Motor Marini, I know it's an Italian company, but it's backed by and owned by China. Even it. So they've come out with that bike, perfect, a twin cylinder, 
plenty enough power, looks good, good price, £7,000. I mean, where are the Japanese? Where is that Transart? Where is... I mean, I know we've got the Tenere 700, but you've got to be a giant to ride it properly. Uh, where's the Kawasaki Versus 650 with a off-road or adventure bias bike? So where's Suzuki? You know, where are the, where are the established brands? Okay, this is going to annoy the guy behind me. Oh, fuck me. I'm just... Oh, shit. Bikes just cut out. Why did that happen? Not the best place at all. Oh, sugar me. Sugar Ray Leonard. I'm right on a bloody blind corner. That's fucking absolutely terrible place. What's happened there then? That bike was just running absolutely joyfully. That's good you didn't get rear-ended. Let's try that reprime it. Could be the fact that the ABS sensor has been out for the last hour. Let's not blame the bike, let's blame the man who's riding the bike, who broke the ABS sensor. Flip. The dinner's ready as well. It's not going to start, that's not. Right, it's very interesting. Right, I'm going to cut this video and update you shortly when I'm either run over by a bus or back on the road. Cheers. What the hell has happened there? Okay, so just walking, uh, just left the bike, just walking in search of a mobile phone signal to call home, or maybe a taxi or one of the two. So yeah, delighted my wife is to come out and fetch me, uh, and then come back from the van. So a bit frustrating, I don't have any tools on me, so I can't get to the, behind the panel to have a look. If uh, it, Most likely I think it's going to be one of the connectors that's just come loose uh, after we've been prodding around with it with the ABS sensor. So I think very much it's all connected. That's the plan. See you somewhere. Cheers.